Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Um, this week, again, as we mentioned last week, um, again, this will be on the spies uh, part two. So in last week's My Thought, we began to try to understand the incident with the spies. What motivated them? Uh, what was their logic? How could such illustrious individuals err so grievously? At the same time, why was the nation condemned to travel in the desert for 40 years? Was it really a punishment or was it just tough parenting? Let us look closer at the facts and see what there is for us to learn from this story in the Torah. In life, many times, you know, we see what we want to see and we're blind to the truth. The spies were surrounded by miracles and yet somehow, they were able to ignore or, or, or at least turn them into negatives. Rashi tells us that it should have taken the spies 160 days to traverse the land. However, since it was revealed before God Almighty that he would decree upon them one year for every day that they traversed the land, he shortened the way before them. So a journey that should have taken 160 days, they traversed in only 40 days. Rabbi Shlomo Carlin states that the fact that God made the miracle and shortened the way for them really should have convinced the spies that God could and would make them inherit the land. Miracles are for believers. Those who do not believe do not see. As they say, for believers there are no questions, and for non-believers there are no answers. They turn their positives into negatives. Everywhere they went, they saw the populace were burying their dead. This they interpreted as a negative, whereas God really orchestrated it as a positive. The people of the land were so busy burying their dead that they didn't take notice of 12 able-bodied strangers in their midst. The Torah in verse 20 tells us that Moshe told the spies to bring back some of the fruit of the land. He tells them that it was the time of harvesting of the grapes. The tour tells us that Moshe encouraged them not to be afraid about taking from the produce of the land and thereby drawing attention to themselves as spies. So during the harvest season, it was customary for farmers to sleep in their fields in order to protect their produce from thieves. As we read about the story in Ruth, when she came to Boaz at night, he was sleeping on the threshing floor. He was sleeping outside in the field so as to protect his harvest. Yet somehow the spies were able to come and go with the fruit and no one bothered them at all. And still, huh, somehow they didn't see the hand in God of all of this. The spies were all from the leaders of 50. Uh, that's important because those were the ones who were chosen to be spiritual leaders of the generation. So why would they want to speak badly against the land? They saw the desert experience as what you might call me'en olam haba, a taste of the world to come. According to their assessment, the desert afforded them all that they needed, physically and spiritually. They were able to sit and learn Torah all day without being bothered with, without many of the challenges of life, such as making a living. When they said that it was a land that devoured its inhabitants, their statement wasn't a lie. Once they entered the land, the nation would have to become farmers. Their days would be dominated from morning until evening with working the land and caring for their animals. When would they have time to pray and learn? They would be forced to live what we would call a natural existence. In addition, in the desert, the spies were leaders. Once they entered their land, their status would automatically be diminished. Many people find it difficult, if not impossible, to give up honor and power. So the spies convinced themselves that they, in reality, were helping the people to not only attain, but to retain the spiritual high that the desert afforded them. Once they entered the land, the real world, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for them to sustain that level of spirituality. And this is where they sin grievously. Many times people think, you know, that, that God wants us to live our lives as angels. That is not the case. God already has angels. What God wants is for an imperfect human being to serve him in this physical world in spite of all of its many challenges. You know, God told Moshe exactly what he wanted. 
a dira betaktoni, a dwelling place in this lower world. The spies wanted nothing to do with this physical world. They only wanted to connect to heaven, which to them meant living in the desert, eating from the mun, drinking from the well of Miriam, and being surrounded by the clouds of glory. Utopia. Who could ask for more? God did not agree with their plan. He took the Jewish nation out of the servitude of Egypt so that they could receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. Once they received the Torah, they were then scheduled to travel to the land of Canaan and inherit it. This was the land that God had promised that he would give to the descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was a precious gift that he wanted the children of the forefathers to inhabit, a land flowing with milk and honey, the palace of the king of the universe, the gateway to heaven. When looking at the whole scenario, one has to wonder, why is it that God forgave the nation after the sin of the golden calf and not after the incident with the spies? There can be little doubt that the spies erred grievously. Somehow they thought that they knew what was best for the nation even better than God Almighty himself. They were able to exploit the people's doubts and insecurities. They did not create them with their report. They just allowed them to rise to the surface. They made the people realize that they were, as the Rambam stated, a slave nation with a slave mentality. For their incendiary words, they paid dearly. They paid with their lives. Though many commentaries say that the nation did not believe in God, you know, I believe that the opposite is true. I think that they did believe in God and all that he can perform. They erred in that they didn't believe in themselves. They didn't think that they were worthy of all of God's miracles. They knew that on a natural level there was no way that they could defeat the seven nations of the land in battle. They suffered from a lack of confidence. So in the end, they didn't believe in themselves, nor did they believe that they deserved that God should continue to perform miracles for them. Based on those facts, God had no choice but to have them wander in the desert until the older generation had passed on. Now, although it does seem that the generation in the desert was punished, after all, they were sentenced to die in the desert. And the Medrash says that every year on the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, which was the anniversary of the sin of the spies, that each year during those 40 years that they traveled in the desert, the older generation was commanded to dig their own graves and then spend that night sleeping in them. In the morning, Moshe would call out, let the living separate from the dead. And each year, some 15,088 men would die. Well, that does seem like a punishment. Somehow, they were perceived by God as a cancer that needed to be removed so that the patient could live. Their children, the children of Israel. When looking closely at the facts, we realize certain benefits and kindnesses that this older generation experienced while they were alive in the desert. Now, even though they were told that they would all die in the desert, not one of those that died, died under the age of 60. In addition, there is no mention of any sickness or infirmity before their deaths. Now, in the year 1908, in the United States, the average lifespan of the American male was only 47 years old. Not only that, I can guarantee you that most of those men who died suffered greatly before they actually passed on. That was not the case for those Jewish men who died in the desert. They all lived until the age of 60, and they died without sickness or pain. You know, the Talmud tells us that if a person is having difficulty dealing with his Yetzirah, his evil inclination, so first they should learn Torah. If that doesn't work, then let them recite the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. If that doesn't help them to overcome their evil inclination, so the sages tell us, then let them visit a cemetery and think about the day of death. Now imagine if every year, instead of fasting on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, we would be commanded to spend the night in a grave, a grave that we had dug ourselves. You know, I don't think that any of us would sleep that night. 
No, I think that we would think seriously all night about all of our misdeeds and of all the time we wasted on nonsense. Our thoughts would be focused on a true and deep repentance. If we were alive in the morning, I think that we would not be the same person who entered the grave that night before. Though we may still be alive, we would hope that we had somehow buried the evil within us in that grave. I would think that it would be a reality check on all the decisions and actions that we had chosen throughout the previous year. Fasting for one day? Hmm. Just can't compare. Though the whole generation that left Egypt died in the desert, their children, those who had been brought up as free men in the desert, they were the ones that entered the land. They had grown up surrounded by all the daily miracles that occurred in the desert. In addition, they learned Torah and the skills of warfare from Moshe himself. They would conquer the land with self-confidence, confidence in themselves and confidence in God their Father in heaven, that he would protect them and ensure their success. We read in the portion of Chukas that at the end of the 40 years in the desert, that Moshe sent spies to spy out the town of Yazir. Rashi commenting on this verse writes that the spies themselves captured the town. They said, we shall not do like the former spies. We are confident in the power of the prayer of Moshe to wage war. We also read in the book of Yoshua, Joshua, that he sent two spies to the city of Jericho, Jericho, to spy out the city before the nation mounted an attack. The two spies were successful. We see that 40 years later, after being groomed in the desert, that the nation was more than ready to conquer the land. They, the children of Israel, had confidence in themselves and complete belief in God Almighty, their Father in heaven. They had witnessed firsthand how God had cared for all their needs while they were growing up in the desert. We, too, need to learn a lesson from the children of Israel that conquered the land. We need to be confident in our heritage and in our mission to help bring godliness and peace wherever we are. Instead of seeing the land as a gift from a benevolent father, the spies somehow perceived it as a land that devoured its inhabitants. Don't we still do the same thing today? Wherever we are, whatever we do, it's not an accident. God wants us to live in a certain place, to follow a certain profession, to marry a certain spouse, and to bring certain children into this world. We may not agree with all of his choices, but we really don't have a vote. God, our Father, knows and wants what is best for each one of us individually. You know, no two people look alike. We are all unique. And so God has orchestrated a unique existence for each and every one of us. We may not agree with the journey, but in the end, all that he designs for us is perfect and will lead us directly to paradise. The fact that God had the nation travel in the desert for 40 years was the greatest gift that he could have bestowed upon us. If they had gone directly into the land instead of spending those 40 years in the desert, we would have become a nation of farmers. By remaining in the desert for those 40 years, we became the people of the book. We are referred to as Ma'aminim b'nei Ma'aminim, believers, the children of believers. Those 40 years in the desert engraved within the DNA of the Jewish people a belief and faith that has carried us out through all of our tumultuous history. You know, there's another scenario where God has chosen to send spies. Before God sends one of his precious diamonds into this world, the birth of a child, he first sends two spies to reconnoiter the land. These spies are our two parents. They have the responsibility and privilege of providing God's diamonds with all the information and guidance that they will need to navigate through this minefield that we call life. God Almighty expects our parents to fulfill their mission in the hope that all of his diamonds will succeed on their journey through this ex existence in this physical world. The Torah ends with the Hebrew words, the Ene called B'nai Yisrael, before the eyes of all of Israel. History is defined as eyewitness report. If I were to ask you, did George Washington live? He would answer, of course. After all, history testifies that he lived. Eyewitness report. But think of it. How many people really saw George Washington in the flesh? Maybe 100,000? 
And yet, we are certain that he existed. There has never been any event in the history of the world that was witnessed by over 3 million people daily for 40 years. Every day, they were nourished from the miraculous mud, the food of angels that descended from heaven. Every day, they drank from the miraculous well that accompanied them as they journeyed through the barren desert. And every day, they were enveloped on all six sides by the clouds of glory, which afforded them protection against the harsh elements of the wilderness. Yes, the desert experience was a major factor in the development and makeup of the nation of Israel and its survival throughout its long history. Let us, let us always remember that God is our benevolent parent, and at times, he is compelled to administer tough love to us. But no matter what we may think in the moment, all that God does for us and to us is out of love. We do complain, but only because we are looking at a picture in time. When the redemption comes, then we will be able to view the whole movie. Only then will everything that we have experienced in our lives become crystal clear. And with that foundation, may we be instrumental in helping to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Let me wish you all a good week, a safe week, a healthy week, a happy week. And again, Shabbat Shalom. And again, thank you for attending. God bless.